Welcome everybody. Um, thank you for making time to join us this morning amidst um, your busy schedule. I hope you had a nice uh, long weekend and uh, National Day celebration. So um, Mong Lee will, uh, will begin uh, our session this today with some opening remarks and then um, that will be followed by uh, the key findings presentation by, by myself. And then we'll have a short break followed by uh, an expert panel discussion. Um, we have uh, Aaron, who will be one of the speakers, uh, as well as um, Chi Kong from Media Corp. Uh, I think he, he will call in, in a, a little bit later on, as well as Anne Kruger from Australia. And she's also running late because she's getting her uh, vaccination today. So uh, she, she will try and join us as soon as she can. But if not, she did send us a pre-made video uh, to, that, that we can play just in case she doesn't make it. Um, so anyways, um, uh, I'll, we'll, we'll begin. And Meng Li, thank you very much for um, opening. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, my name is Mong Li. I'm uh, the director of the NUS Center for Trusted Internet and uh, Community, CITIC for short, together with uh, Prof. Audrey Yue, uh, the deputy director, and uh, Prof. Uh, Ko Chi Guan, uh, the director of uh, IPOL. We would like to welcome you to our expert stakeholder workshop on pre-banking fake news. Uh, this workshop is jointly co-hosted with the Lloyd's uh, Register Foundation Institute for the uh, Public Understanding of Risk, IPO for short. Um, this event brings together uh, members from the academic and industry landscape and provides an opportunity for us to connect, exchange ideas and learn from each other. Um, misinformation continues to run rampant, creating polarization and confusion. Uh, it is increasingly hard to detect because every falsehood is often cloaked in partial truth. Fallacious rumours are impeding vaccine rates at a critical time, but I'm glad that uh, one of our panellists is going for her vaccine this morning. Uh, faced with lockdowns to curb the spread of the Delta variant, uh, variant of COVID-19, people are spending more and more time online, and this is affecting their digital well-being. So it's more essential than ever to study the effects of uh, misinformation and the internet on society. Um, through the expertise of our computer scientists, social scientists, and policy makers, CITIC aims to research and develop uh, insights, tools, policies, and best practices to combat misinformation and strive towards an accountable internet that enhances the health of our society. So today we are pleased to share the key findings from one of our pilot projects. Uh, led by Dr. Catherine Wong, this pilot study explores what makes society resilient to deception by fake news. She experimented with the use of a fake news game to see if the intervention was effective in increasing our ability to identify online misinformation. We are also honoured to have a panel of accomplished leaders from the government and industry, uh, DS uh, Aaron from the Ministry of Communications and Information, Mr. Lo Chi Kyung, uh, Deputy Chief Director, Media Corp, and uh, Ms. Ang Gregor, APEC Director, First Draft. Uh, I look forward to our discussion and uh, engagement with them later. Okay, so uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Catherine Wong. I think uh, she's uh, known to many of you. She's an applied sociologist with more than 10 years of research experience in uh, public and expert risk uh, perceptions. Her work explores how technology and attitudes towards uh, science um, uh, shape risk perception and acceptable risk. She's interested in the public expert perception gap and the factors that influence and close the gap. Catherine has conducted a few studies in various uh, countries, including India, China, Singapore, Australia. Uh, so please join me to welcome Catherine. Thank you so much, Wang Li. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just uh, jump into uh, the, the presentation that I've prepared. So let me just share the screen here. Uh, 
Okay. Um, I guess everyone can see the presentation slide, yeah? <clears throat> Perfect. Um, okay, so as, as Mongli kind of uh, just alluded to earlier, uh, this um, presentation, this workshop, today's workshop, as well as Friday's uh, sessions uh, are based on this uh, pilot study that was funded by CITIC. And it was conducted over a period of one year from August, that started August last year um, uh, and ended in July this year. So just a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> Um, I am the, the PI for this project, and uh, I also had two co-investigators uh, collaborating with me on this. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Olivia Jensen from IPUR. Um, I guess you can wave, I'm not sure if everyone can see. Uh, as well as Dr. Elmi Mehmet, uh, who's also here with us today uh, from the NUS School of Communications and New Media. Um, I also want to acknowledge, uh, I had a really amazing crew of research assistants. Um, Aaron Sia from the School of Computing, he's not here with us today because he graduated and is now with Shopee. Um, and he's the one that created the, the game, uh, helped us to create the game uh, in this, for the study. And then I also had um, Hazel Tay and Cindy To, uh, who are from the uh, NUS uh, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, who also uh, were really important in helping me to put together the whole um, the study. Um, and also uh, we have uh, Yuan Yuan, who uh, also is with us here today, um, who helped uh, with the quantitative analysis of the study. And she's doing her PhD uh, at NUS, I think also at the School of Communications and New Media. So um, the concept for this workshop was really to create um, a forum where we can share the preliminary results from this pilot study and get some responses and comments from a, a wide range of perspectives. Uh, and so there's a very deliberate intent in programming to get panelists and participants, not just from academia, but also practitioners from government, uh, from, uh, journalists, um, and people who provide fact-checking services to comment on the study and to raise questions that maybe you know, we as researchers have not really thought to ask yet. So this is why we wanted to keep this workshop a closed door event with a smaller group of participants so that we can have a, a, a more in-depth uh, and substantive discussion. Now there are three parts to this presentation that I'm about to make. Um, I'll start first with a brief context to the research problem, and then I'll explain the research design and the methods and tools that I use so that when I talk about the key findings, it'll make a little bit more sense. <clears throat> So if you look at the countermeasures um, <clears throat> against fake news that are out there today, they broadly fit into kind of three categories. The first one is regulatory, where you, know, you pass new laws and regulations to deter people from putting fake news out there. The second category, category falls under um, content labeling on social media, where you have you know, notifications before to prompt you to see, you know, do you want to read the content before sharing? Um, uh, uh, or, or to notify you that the, this, this information that you're about to share has been disputed. And then the third category has to do with fact-checking functions, um, both by government um, uh, organizations as well as non-governmental organizations to debunk falsehoods that are out there, especially online. <clears throat> Now, these countermeasures are for the most part based on the idea of uh, reactive refutation by debunking fake news after it appears um, uh, in the public domain. And, and this is, uh, these measures are aimed at the question of how do we reduce exposure to fake news? In this pilot study, we tried to approach this problem uh, of fake news from a slightly different perspective by asking first, how can we increase people's resilience against deception by fake news. And we do this by experimenting with a fake news game as a pre-bunking tool, which is based on the idea of preemptive reputation. Now, this um, approach is broadly based on the theory of social inoculation. And this theory argues that it is possible to inoculate individuals against fake news by preemptively presenting them with a kind of like a weakened version of a misleading piece of information. And then this will trigger a thought process that is very much similar to the cultivation of mental bodies. 
Uh, and this, in theory, would then render immunity to the individual to, to subsequent exposures to fake news. So uh, by preemptively exposing people um, to a weakened version of misinformation or disinformation, it is possible to help that person uh, develop attitudinal resistance against fake news. So um, based on this overall kind of uh, uh, research problem, we uh, structured um, three main sets of research question, um, which I, I will focus on these three just for today's presentation. Of course, we have the COVID-19 vaccine perceptions part of things, but for today's uh, workshop, I will only focus on the fake news um, uh, and disinformation side of the study. So the first set of question is, of course, is the intervention effective? Did the fake news game uh, increase people's ability to identify online mis and disinformation? The second set of research questions goes a little bit more into the details of the effects, specifically whether are the effects narrow spectrum or broad spectrum? Meaning in the game itself, we made the game about COVID-19 vaccines. And in the pre-game and post-game uh, fake news tests, we asked them a range of questions that included fake news about COVID-19 vaccines, as well as fake news that are about other stuff. So we wanted to see whether the effects were only um, effective on COVID-19 vaccine questions, or was, was the effects more broad, uh, broadly applied to other fake news uh, that is not about the topic of the game. <clears throat> That's what it means by narrow spectrum and broad spectrum. Then we also wanted to see whether participants changed their pre-existing beliefs about, um, uh, specifically in this case, we asked them about science um, after playing the game. And we also wanted to see whether there were intergenerational and gender differences in the inoculation effects of the game. Now, the third set of questions had to do more with the perceptions. We wanted to use the game as a way to start a conversation about fake news to understand um, what, what were our participants' um, concerns about fake news? How aware are they about the risks of fake news um, and their own exposure, as well as what were the factors that kind of mitigated those concerns? <coughs> so uh, we take in the study a very broad definition of fake news to include um, both misinformation, which is simply just information that is false or incorrect, and it could include uh, human error, and as well as this information, which involves misinformation, but with a deliberate intent to deceive the audience. So to answer this question, uh, these questions, I mean, we use a, a mixed methods approach, which uh, you know, of course combine the use of the experimental tools like the fake news game and the, the fake news tests um, with two questionnaires. So one questionnaire before the game and another one after um, and a focus group discussion with the treatment group after playing the game. So let me go a little bit into more details about these instruments, um, okay. So the game itself was designed to get players to role play as one of four fake news characters that have been identified in the literature. So the alarmist, the first one, alarmist is somebody who tries to make a very small issue look very, very big and problematic. The denier is almost the opposite, which who is uh, somebody, a fake news producer who tries to make um, a problem look very, very small and insignificant. Um, uh, and to downplay the severity of the problem. The third character is called the clipping monger. And that person is basically someone who just like puts out content out there in a way to get as many clicks, as many likes and shares as possible. So typically this person would um, sensationalize a topic um, <clears throat> or hint at some kind of scandal. Uh, and the fourth um, character is called the conspiracy theorist who is somebody who distrusts the official narrative um, and wants to convince uh, his or her audience to also distrust official narratives. So now each of these characters use a combination of five deception techniques. So the first one uh, is impersonation, which is a technique uh, that fake news producers use by posing as a real person. So like, you know, pretending to be the prime minister or to be from a legitimate news site or a legitimate scientific organization. The second technique is 
the use of uh, emotional content, which plays into people's basic emotions, such as fear or anger or empathy. The third deception technique is, is called polarization, which typically uh, involves a deliberate the use of language in a way to expand um, uh, the political gap uh, in society or, or among the readers and to drive people away from the political center. Fourth is a conspiracy, which um, is a technique, a deception technique that involves the spread of the belief that there are you know, unexplained events out there that are orchestrated by a covert group or organization with very sinister intentions. So like you know, the deep state, for example. <clears throat> and the fifth strategy is um, the, uh, the, called discrediting opponents, which is the use of communication techniques that attack the source of the criticism. So, uh, so for example, you know, when Do Dr. Fauci says uh, that you know, there's a lot of fake news out there about, um, about the vaccines, then the anti-vaxxers would then uh, you know, uh, uh, instead say, no, Dr. Fauci is the one that's fake news. He said this five months ago and now he's changing his position on this. So they, they discredit um, scientists, they discredit a credible organization as a way uh, to uh, mislead the readers. So um, I'm just going to give you just like a snapshot of what the game looks like. Uh, so on the gaming day itself, we, you know, of course, we gave our, our participants a, a Zoom link to call into Zoom, and then we assigned them into uh, to groups uh, or players that were playing individually. We just gave them the link to, um, to the gaming platform. So this is the landing page on the top left-hand quadrant uh, of the game uh, gaming platform. And then we gave them like, you know, the username to log in. And typically the username would be one of the four uh, fake news characters. So either the alarmist, the denialist, conspiracy theorist, or clickbait monger. Now we, you will see that there's Chinese here. We actually created a Chinese version. Um, we translated the game into Chinese as well because we wanted to see if language had a role to play as well, but then we didn't manage to get enough Chinese speaking players. So uh, we, we just didn't really use this very much. So then they will enter the name, uh, their username, click on English and then play. So when you click on play, you enter into something that looks like this. So this is the first, <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, I mean, of course there's, there's a, you know, a few more slides uh, uh, or rather pages before this with a demo video to explain the context of the game, what the, the rules and what are your goals in this game. Now, this is the first kind of first page of the, the start of the game. So here you see is that um, the, the character that was assigned to this player is called the alarmist. And then this in the game, they're supposed to create a fake news article about COVID-19 vaccines. And there are eight sections to this article. So the eight dots that you see at the bottom represent the different sections. This is the first section, so it's called the title. And these are pre-prepared content. So as an alarmist, the player has to choose which of these cards best represent uh, or best um, would be the kind of uh, title an alarmist would choose. Uh, for their title about the COVID-19 vaccines. So they can pick one and then click next and that will take them to the next and next and next sections. Um, this here characters, when you click on this, what you see is at the bottom uh, right hand corner of all the different character goals so that players can refer back to um, what is the goal of the character. The goal here for in the case of Alarmist is to exaggerate the significance or impact of an event. And then uh, once they've kind of like um, finished everything, they can actually, you know, jump from four to seven, back to two and all that uh, using these buttons. And then once they've picked everything, uh, content, the cards for all the different sections, they can click on article and this is what they will see, the overview of all the content that they had chosen. So they can kind of see whether the article actually flows, whether they want to make changes. If they want to say, I want to change the text that I chose for interpretation, then I will click on this and then it'll send them back to a page like that where they can reevaluate the choices that they have made. So um, if there's any questions about this, I, you can raise it later at the end of, um, of this presentation. 
So to give you an idea of what the fake news um, test looks like, so the test was run on Quartrix. So we would send each participant a personalized link because we needed to track their grades, um, the test scores. And uh, then they could play, they could just do the quiz on their mobile phone or on, on the computer, it's also fine. And this is what they see. So they'll see a stimuli. Of course, this stuff is not on their screen. This is only for, uh, for, for me. And then we, they were told that they had one minute maximum. So there's a timer that goes off one minute maximum to answer whether the stimuli is mostly true or mostly false. <coughs> and we gave them a mixture of uh, stimuli that was fake news as well as true news and also from different social media. So um, I think this one was uh, Instagram. I can't remember what this one was from, but we also had from Twitter, from WhatsApp and from Facebook. So this is the sequence of the experimental protocol. A few days before gaming day, we would send our treatment group the link to do the, um, the fake news test, but this would be, uh, be they would first do a, a short um, questionnaire followed by the first fake news test. Then on gaming day, they would sign in onto Zoom uh, where they would play the game either Depending on how many people signed up for that day, the groups could be between two people, uh, two in a group to four in a group. And then after playing the game, we would get, send them another link to Quart a Quartrix link to do the second big news test. And then this was then followed by this, this uh, second questionnaire. And then after they've done that, they would all come back to the Zoom call to do the focus group discussion. And we were really lucky with our uh, treatment group participants because we didn't have a single dropout after, the, um, after doing the, the, the second test. Everybody came back to uh, the Zoom call to continue with the focus group discussion. And then to see whether um, the effects of the game were sustained, um, we gave them another fake news test um, a few days after gaming day. So each test had 10 questions, and so the scores that I will discuss later um, are out of 10. <clears throat> um, I just want to come back a little bit to the focus group discussion. Um, so in the FGDs, we, we conducted semi, a semi-structured discussion, which means um, every session, every focus group discussion included the same sets of questions with some uh, leeway for variation. So we asked all our treatment group participants, what were their key points, key learning points from the game? What were their biggest concerns about fake news and any mitigating factors for those concerns? And also any perceived upsides of fake news because we also wanted to get a sense of you know, what was the appeal of fake news to, to people. And of course we did the same for the COVID-19 vaccine questions but I will talk about that on Friday. Now we initially um, thought about uh, you know, recording the focus group discussions, but then we, 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 um, we changed that in the end uh, to, to having note takers instead for, uh, to record, uh, to, to come up with the transcripts from the discussion um, so that our participants will feel a little bit more comfortable to, to speak freely. And then we coded the transcripts in MaxQDA, which is a qualitative um, uh, analysis software, uh, data analysis software. And we use a combination of structural coding, which is top-down research question driven, as well as effective coding, which is bottom-up data driven to identify what are the range of major and minor themes that kind of represent um, or that reflect our participants' perceptions about um, uh, risk perceptions about fake news and also mitigating factors. So you see all of that later on when I present the data. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm just gonna give you a quick summary of the participant demographics. So we had a total of 122 participants, 68 in the treatment group and 54 in the control group. So the control group uh, did the, um, the, the first and the second fake news test as well as the first and the second questionnaire, but they didn't do the gaming intervention and they also didn't do the sustainability test. Um, you'll see that majority of our sample were millennials. Um, uh, so 82% millennials and also majority of our sample were females. So about 64% of our sample were females. 
Um, and then in terms of education, you can also see most of our participants were highly educated. Um, and the, uh, in terms of religion, it pretty much reflects the same findings as, as was reported in the, um, the, the recent national census. <clears throat> okay. So, to answer the first um, question, was the fake news game intervention effective? Um, so we, bearing in mind that our sample was really small, just uh, about 122 um, uh, uh, participants, we ran a covariance analysis and we found that the treatment uh, sadly did not turn up uh, as a significant factor in influencing the post game test scores. Um, after we controlled for the, for the pre-game test score. But this finding is not particularly surprising um, in the sense that uh, our sample, as I said, was very small and other similar um, uh, uh, experiments that were run using the same experimental protocol on the topic of COVID-19 with more than 700 uh, participants in the sample, even that study didn't turn up a significant result and then when they, um, they expanded the sample to more than 1,000 participants, that's when they started to see significant results. So I think um, we'll, we, in order to really draw uh, any robust statistical uh, conclusions from, from this experimental design, we really need a much, much larger uh, sample, but it's fine. I mean, this was really just a pilot study, right? Um, but we did find other interesting stuff. So when we looked at the test scores itself, um, this figure that you see on the left-hand side uh, reflects the test scores of the pre-game and the post-game. Um, <clears throat> fake news tests, both by the treatment group and the control group. So control group is green and treatment is blue. And we saw that actually our participants were already quite good at identifying fake news. So the con control group was even better than the treatment group. And most, uh, you know, most of them scored uh, almost um, uh, seven out of 10 questions. The second you see that in the, the second news test, fake news test, uh, the scores kind of came down a little bit. And I think this was really, um, is, is reflecting the, the fact that our second, um, our post game fake news test was actually a little bit more difficult. And we did get some comments from our participants in the focus group discussion about this. And so you see that the scores came down. Um, and uh, so we are looking to see how we can correct this in the experiment design itself. Now, then we also looked at whether, um, more people got the true questions correct in, uh, in the post-game fake news test as opposed to the um, pre-game fake news test as an indication to see whether uh, our treatment group got more suspicious after playing the game. And we did find some indication of that. Now, um, uh, this is the second test. So the, this figure that you see on the right-hand side are the, the percentage of participants in the control group and the treatment group that got the true questions correct in the second fake news test. Now, the, the first fake news test was, the results for this was a bit mixed, um, but for the post game fake news test, we, we saw quite a consistent um, trend that, um, you know, the control group consistently had um, the true questions, more of the true questions, uh, sorry, the true questions correct more often than the treatment group, indicating that maybe suggesting that there is maybe a high level of suspicion among the treatment group after playing the game. Now, remember earlier I mentioned that there are five deception techniques used by fake news producers, right? And um, in our fake news test, um, we included questions that used each of the five techniques. Um, so and so in the analysis, we wanted to compare which of these techniques were the most successful at deceiving our participants. And we found that uh, of all the five techniques, impersonation was the most successful at deceiving our participants. So this percentage here reflects the percentage of the total sample, so control and treatment, that answered uh, impersonation questions correctly. So you see that less than half uh, of the total sample answered questions that use impersonation as a deception technique correctly. 
The rest was quite high. So, you know, questions that used emotional content, polarization, conspiracy, all around, you know, 75% to, uh, to just over 80% of the sample got those questions correct. Now, for the questions around the other, um, the, the, the narrow spectrum or broad spectrum effects, we found that um, the treatment did not have any significant effects on the test scores for vaccine related questions or for non vaccine related questions. And also for the questions about the pre existing beliefs, uh, we asked participants the same question you know, how much. Uh, do you trust um, scientists in general before and after the game? And then we ran a paired t-test to see if the participants in a treatment group changed their ratings about trust uh, in, in scientists in general. And there was no significant difference at all, meaning that the game did not change their level of trust in scientists. In terms of the test scores itself, we didn't really find any um, intergenerational differences uh, or gender differences in the ability to identify fake news. Um, but we did find some interesting differences in other aspects uh, in the questionnaire and the, um, the qualitative da data results. So one dimension is the level of confidence. So um, this figure here on the left-hand side uh, shows the, the responses to the questions of, to the question of how good do you think you are at identifying um, a fake news post uh, or, or article, right? So you will see that, um, and this is divided by age group. So you see that um, about 60% of millennials uh, rated that, well, think, think that they're somewhat good or, or extremely good at identifying fake news. And then, um, that figure is just above 50% for, uh, for the Gen X, uh, Gen X Bs. Gen X Bs refer to Gen X boomers who are between the age of 40 and 79 in, in our sample. And the reason why we, we made such a big uh, kind of like gap, uh, you know, or we, we lump such a big group into Gen X Bs is because we really didn't have that many um, uh, participants in the, in the, in the boomer uh, um, age group. Um, so now, when we then compare this, the, the self-rating of self-confidence in identifying fake news with the actual fake news test scores, we found some uh, mixed results. So this table that you see on the right-hand side shows the test scores uh, of participants by the, the, the level of self-confidence. So in the pre-game test, fake news test, we saw that participants that rated themselves very badly in terms of the ability to identify fake news actually scored much better than participants who, who indicated a strong level of confidence in identifying fake news. So uh, this was the mean test scores of uh, but the participants who indicated that they were somewhat bad at identifying fake news. And then this is uh, the mean test score for those that indicated they're extremely good. Then when you come to the post game, oh, and bear in mind, so this and this, the first two sets of bars are the, the control and treatment group combined. Um, then when you come to the second uh, post game test, we saw that the trend was reversed. So participants who indicated a low level of confidence in um, uh, identifying fake news scored worse than those who ex uh, indicated a high level of confidence. Um, and, and those that indicated high level of confidence actually scored really well, like 8.2 out of 10 in the, in the post-game fake news test. And this trend was continued in the sustain, uh, sustainability test. <clears throat> so these results, uh, mixed as they are, they, they kind of you know, run counter to some, a number of studies that have been done in the US and in the UK that found um, that people who have a high level of confidence tend to do quite badly at uh, differentiating between so-called real and fake news. But um, again, you know, I need to come back to the fact that our sample was really small. And so we do, do need to have a much larger sample to be able to draw any uh, uh, strong uh, statistical con conclusions from this finding. Now in the qualitative data set, we also found some intergenerational and gender differences in terms of the key learning points from the game. 
So um, most participants across all age groups found that the introduction to the four characters of fake news game, uh, uh, sorry, fake news producers was the idea that stuck the most in their minds. Um, and they found that it was a good framework for helping them to identify the intent of fake news content and also the use of uh, deception techniques. Now, we, we found that only female participants made comments that indicated some degree of self-reflexivity from playing the game. So um, uh, some Gen X, Gen X B females uh, noted that the game made them question how they have consumed news about current affairs and the foundations of their background knowledge. And similarly, millennial females also noted that, that the game made them reflect uh, on, on how, they, um, how, how they consume uh, information in the past. Now, the, the, th the, the theme of semantic techniques was something that only the millennials identified and not, uh, not it was a theme that didn't emerge at all among Gen XBs. And this specifically kind of referred to um, the, the, the semantic techniques that they picked up from the, from the game content itself that uh, would kind of flag that this information is most likely to be either uh, to be a fake news. So in particular, they highlighted things like, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, understanding the word choices, especially for the headlines and the subheadings, uh, stories that are the use of language to uh, present a, a shock factor or, or exaggerate um, a particular issue and uses, use of words like collusion were for them the key signifiers that they learned from the game uh, that would indicate that this particular information is most probably fake news. And then fact checking, so the importance of fact checking was another key learning point um, that was mentioned only by millennial participants and not at all by, by um, Gen XBs. But it's important to note, <coughs> excuse me, um, that even though this, this was quite a major theme that emerged from millennials, actually none of them used the fact checking function or very few of them actually used the fact checking function in the game. And even the, the few that did when, you know, the moderator kind of like prompted them to say, oh, if you're not sure, you can click on the fact checking function. Um, none of them actually clicked on the reference link that we had provided for them. Um, so, uh, but, you know, I think that could also be just a function of the game that they were under time pressure. They had to finish it in 30 minutes. Um, and so they didn't really have the time to uh, really go into fact checking during playing the game. Now, um, then we come to the to this third set of research questions. Um, when we come to the question of what were participants' perceptions about fake news and what mitigates their concerns, we then started to see some more pronounced gender and intergenerational differences start to emerge. <clears throat> Okay, so what you see here is the coding result for um, the questions about um, their, their major concerns about fake news. Um, so so we, we separated the transcripts into four categories um, uh, by, by gender and by age. So these here are the Gen X, uh, Gen X B transcripts, uh, coding results, and these here are the millennial coding results. And we, we separated them between females and males as well. So these, these um, texts that you see here are the, the emergent themes, the result from the effective coding that we did uh, that reflect the major and minor themes that reflect the concerns of um, Gen XB females, Gen XB males, millennial females, and millennial males. The dots that you see on the right-hand corner reflect the coding frequency. So the number of times that the uh, segments of text were coded to this particular theme. So the bigger the dot, the, the more frequent this theme was coded or, or, or mentioned in the transcripts. Uh, the small dots here reflect coding frequencies of about one to two. These ones reflect about um, three to four. The slightly larger ones are between um, seven to eight. And the really large ones reflect coding frequencies of about 12 to 13 um, segments of text in the respective transcripts. So um, 
this is quite a lot of information, um, but uh, just at a glance, you can see that um, the there were way more um, uh, uh, thematic emergent themes among the millennials compared to the Gen X boomers. But we also have to bear in mind that um, we did have a lot more millennial participants, as I mentioned earlier, than Gen X boomers. That said, it doesn't always necessarily reflect the, the sample size itself because we had more female Gen X boomers in our sample than males, but males had, uh, you know, had, had a lot more to say than, the, than Gen X uh, boomers females. <clears throat> Um, so one of the things about coding is, is not uh, that we, we don't only just want to see what are the major and minor things, but we also want to see where are the absences. So one of the things that we noticed that was that among millennials, um, there was quite a, a strong um, uh, a result that showed that, you know, they, they kind of, they express a lot of concern, but most of these concerns were directed at other people, not themselves. And there were quite a number of them um, that uh, across both uh, genders that indicated that they're not really exposed to it or they're not vulnerable to fake news. And you see that this was not a theme that came up at all among, uh, that was mentioned at all among the Gen X boomers. Um, <clears throat> so indicating, this, this indicates to us a little bit that, um, that millennials ha had a general tendency to kind of underestimate their own exposure to fake news. Um, and I'll just give you uh, some examples of quotes from our transcripts. Uh, what we, we also found was that the millennials tended to see fake news as a problem mainly for old people uh, and for lower educated people. And also we have to bear in mind that, as I mentioned earlier, a very large percentage of our treatment group, about 65% of them had at least a university degree. <clears throat> So uh, you'll see from these quotes here, you know, uh, from, from millennials uh, who said that, you know, I think younger people are more woke, so they would tend to check information, whereas it's the older people and the aunties that would spread fake news. Um, we had one participant who was very cute who said um, during the, the early days of COVID-19 in Singapore, his mom told him that Zara was going to close down um, and that he should go shopping. And so he, he shared all that. He shared that information with his friends, and, uh, but it turned out to be fake news later on. So he was a bit frustrated by that. Um, now, we also noticed that Gen X B females were mainly concerned with like individual level factors directed at their own ability to discern fake news. So they were very concerned about, you know, uh, that, they, that they find it difficult to, to distinguish between real and fake news. They were afraid about being uh, an accidental conduit um, and falling for scams. Whereas Gen X Bs, they were mainly concerned about societal level factors such as social polarization, uh, questions about who determines the truth. Um, and then, of course, when you look at millennials, they, they expressed a, a, a much wider range of concerns that's both at the individual and societal level. Now, we wanted to also know uh, what were the mitigating factors. So both in the questionnaire and the fo uh, focus group discussion data, um, we found that trust in government and trust in mainstream media were the main mitigating factors for participants' concerns about fake news. But then again, you see some gender and intergenerational differences here. So um, trust in government was a, a, a strong theme for females, um, to some extent, uh, for males as well. But then when you look at millennials, uh, trust in public information was a dominant theme and media literacy. So I'll start first with trust in public information. This was, ref was talked about mainly in terms of um, that they trust mainstream media, information from government websites, research papers, and other official sources from you know, official government websites. But <clears throat> there was, that said, there was quite a bit of doubt towards Western media. So there was strong trust in like mainly local media. Um, and then for media literacy, this was mainly referred to as a combination of um, a cognitive and, and social practice elements. So having, you know, like, uh, intuition, 
to to check up on the, on the information that's being said, uh, critical thinking, knowledge on how to do background checks uh, uh, and cross referencing and following the data trail. So these qualitative results were corroborated by the quantitative questionnaire data as well. So uh, those uh, uh, our colleagues from um, MediaCorp and SPH would be very happy to see that um, <clears throat> there's a very high level of trust in uh, CNA and the Straits Times in our, uh, in our questionnaire. Um, and we also have uh, a very high level of trust in, in government, we, so this is one of the questions that we use to, uh, to, to, to determine the level of trust in the government. Uh, we have more, but then um, uh, I will talk about that in, on Friday session. Lastly, we also wanted to know what was the appeal of fake news by asking participants in the focus group if they perceived any upsides to fake news. Um, and so these were the coding results, but just note that these two circles don't represent the same values. So this one represents a coding frequency of seven. And out of the seven, the major three major themes were that um, uh, among the Gen X bees, they found that um, uh, fake news provides them access to multiple perspectives, uh, critical thinking, and also represents a freedom of speech. Whereas for the millennials, this circle here represents a coding frequency of 22. Uh, codes, uh, segments of text, and the, the, the dominant um, appeal of fake news was access to alternative views and creativity and humor, as well as that, you know, um, you know so, some of this misinformation that's been put out there actually puts pressure on government agencies and, 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 and organizations to be more transparent. So, uh, just to quickly recap, I know we're, we're, I've been talking for a long time. So um, sure, sure, we didn't find any statistically the significant effects from the game, but uh, this was to be expected given the small size of the sample. But we did find other interesting results. There was some indication that the treatment group became more suspicious of information in the post game fake news test with fewer participants in the treatment group um, answering the two questions correctly. Um, in person, we also found that impersonation was the most successful uh, deception technique at um, de deceiving our participants. We found some interesting, surprising results in terms of the level of confidence and people's ability to identify fake news in the case of Singapore. Um, and of course, we, we found um, that in, in the qualitative data, we saw that millennials uh, express a wider, were more, I, I don't know if you can say more aware, but they express a wider range of concerns uh, about fake news, but this was mainly directed at others. Um, and there was a high level of trust, that, or rather the concerns about fake news was mitigated by a high, high level of trust, oops, sorry, in media and the government, um, and that the main appeal of fake news uh, especially for millennials was uh, the access to alternative views and creativity and humor. So I'm sorry, I've been talking for a long time. I'm gonna uh, stop sharing and um, maybe make a little bit of time for uh, some clarification questions before we have a short break in preparation for the next session. Hi, uh, Catherine Chikong here from Hi, Chikong. I got a question. Um, so this, uh, you mentioned two concepts, you talk about self-confidence and talk about uh, complacency. And I just want to make sure that I understand it correctly, uh, because you mentioned that in the treatment group, in millennials, um, they, there's self-confidence and the vis-a-vis -vis the ability to discern fake news. Um, they were able to do that better post-game. Uh, does that reinforce the fact that they are complacent and because I think during the game they would have gotten some kind of reminders. Uh, so is that how to how, how to read the findings? Um, okay, so I think confidence and complacency, there, there could be a link, but we did not uh, design our study to really investigate whether there was a clear link between that. In the game itself, um, um, Initially, we just let them play the game. We didn't prompt them, you know, to like do use the fact checking. And then, 
and, and when we started to notice that in a lot of the groups that were playing the game, they weren't using it, then we started to prompt. Uh, so, so I'm not sure if that actually uh, reflects the level of confidence rather than like, you know, the time pressure that they felt that we have to finish this game in half an hour. Does that answer your question? I guess by virtue of playing the game, they are uh, in fact more aware and mm. sort of less complacent. So they are more alert to any stimuli. Right? Yeah, that, that, that's true. Um, that, that is our hope. Um, and I think that's where it was reflected in the, in the true questions as well. Uh, that you know, in the post game, we saw that more of the, the treatment group participants uh, actually didn't answer the true questions correct because they maybe they were just so much more suspicious and and in a way I guess you could say less complacent um, after playing the game. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Alex. Yeah, thanks. I just had a couple of clarifications. One was about the study design. So uh, is it correct to say that the the treatment group they played the game and the control group did nothing? Or were they similarly exposed to the same fake news, but without gameplay? Yeah, correct. So the treatment group played every did everything, and then um, the control group uh, they just um, did the, the the first and the second fake news test and the two questionnaires, and that was it. So okay, they didn't yeah. play the game. Yeah. But they also weren't exposed to similar material without the game. So the reason I'm asking is, it sounds like the comparison is actually not whether they played a game or not, but whether they were exposed to material, right? So, I mean, you didn't get any significant results, but if you had, I don't know if you could attribute that to the gameplay or to the fact that they were shown that material. Oh, Do you understand what, what material, I mean? Uh, what material are you? The various about? bits of fake news that they were using as part of the gameplay? No, because the they difference were not. With, that's, I mean, that's, that's what I, I see that's yeah. a possible problem in the study design. Mm. But I mean, you didn't get any significant results anyway, so it's not something to be concerned about now. But I don't see what, I mean, it doesn't look like you're comparing between playing the game to find out about fake news. I mean, if your research question is, does playing a game help you to have better sensitivity to fake news? That's not the difference between the two groups. The difference is that they played the game and were exposed to some fake news, whereas the control group did nothing. Do you see my point? Mm, but they were not exposed to um, the the control group were not exposed to uh, the, the five deception techniques and yeah. the five um, fake news characters. So exactly. that's what we were. So you're not I mean, looking, but your RQ was, does playing the game help them to be more sensitive? But your difference between your control group and your treatment group is not that. It's whether they were exposed to the various different types of fake news. It's whether they were exposed to the, I guess, yeah, you could say it was yeah. whether they were exposed to that particular framework of uh, fake news material. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So if you yes. had any results, you couldn't attribute it to the game. But I mean, uh, it, in reality, there's no way that we can uh, really isolate uh, uh, participants, uh, members of the public from, uh, uh, in terms of groups that have never been exposed to fake news materials, because I think at this stage, everyone has been exposed exactly, yeah, to yeah. it. But you could have point. shown, you could have had them read the materials and not play the game. So that the one difference between your two groups is the gameplay. Ah, so, okay, yes. You see what uh, I mean? Yeah, 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 okay, okay. Yeah, yeah that could yeah. be an interesting I mean, something variation to consider of for that. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Hmm. Okay, so that was my first question. My second question was, what was the goal of the game? I mean, what were they trying to do to win? Uh, the goal of the game was to get as many, um, to choose as many correct cards for their character as possible. Mm -hmm. okay. So then they yeah. were at the end of the game, they would get a test, uh, well, a game score of, uh, you know, one, uh, one out of eight or seven out of eight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's also something I think might be worth thinking about in future if you're doing a follow up, because the activity they were doing and to try and win the game is to correctly emulate a certain character type. Right, mm. and it sounds like some of the things they got was they were sort of more aware of the different character types that came up in, in the results. Whereas if your objective is, is to get them to be more sort of aware of fake news, perhaps the game mechanic needs to be more focused on the thing you're trying to teach them rather than what you had done. Because what you were doing, I think, helped them to be a bit more aware of what type of people make fake news, not what should I be doing to make sure I'm aware of fake news. You see the difference? I mean, usually mm -hmm. when you design an educational game, you want to make sure that the mechanic you're using is directly connected to the thing that you're trying to get people to learn because that's what will be transferred outside of the game 
Okay. So I think, I mean, that may be worth thinking about. I mean, we can talk about this offline <laughs> somewhere. I mean, yeah, sorry, sure. My, my background yeah. is game design, so that's why I'm asking uh, okay, this question. Okay, yeah, no, that's yeah, yeah. really So I think it can be refined so that maybe it's more specifically targeted to the thing you want them to learn. I mean, it's, I really like the game idea. I think it just needs to be tweaked a little bit to be maybe a bit more targeted onto what you want them to take away from it. And that, mm. I mean, that could be something that could be done maybe in a follow-up study. I mean, I'd be happy to talk about that more. Sure. Yeah, we can continue this conversation. Great. Yeah. yeah. Hey, thanks. Well, otherwise, I think it's a great study. But, thanks, yeah. Alex. Thank you so much. Uh, Christian. Yeah, thanks. Um, my main uh, yeah, message should concern. Um, when I remember this uh, screen of the app correctly, they saw the news and there was the question, this news byte is mostly true or mostly false, right? Yes. I don't, I'm not sure if this is fair. <laughs> because you know what I mean? I read the news. To learn something I don't know. That means I don't know if it's true or false. This is why I read the news. <laughs> you know, mm. if I'm, to say if it's true or false, I already have to know about it. So it's more like the question would be, do I trust this information or something like this, right? Because uh, it's also not clear to me, what does it mean? If a user identifies fake news, does it mean uh, the user know it's to be false? Does it mean that the news article is written in a style that sounds fake? So, so, so you, you know, I mean, I cannot objectively say that it's true or false. Yeah. It's purely based on my opinion, my, my, my knowledge I have from other backgrounds that people are here. So how can I really say this news is mostly true? This objectively yeah. it doesn't work, right? Yeah. No, but I think um, you are assuming that people read news in order to inform themselves about something that they don't know. But this is the whole thing about social media. People don't, we're, we're being fed news whether or not we want to read it. And we choose which ones to click or read a little bit more uh, based on like the sensationalism of the headlines or my own pre-existing interest in that particular issue. So we already come from slightly different kind of assumptions about what, why people consume news, but you are true, you're right. Um, there, there are various, um, you know, that in, in different uh, other iterations of this experiment, um, they, they, they got people to, um, they, they rather more tested what are people's likelihood to share the information rather than to judge is this mostly true or mostly false. Um, uh, but I think, um, but that is testing of a very different um, behavior. Whether you share something or not doesn't tell, doesn't say how much um, your, your truth judgment about yes. that particular information. And this is what we wanted to try and get into, your truth judgment. Um, and you are right. This is um, when we ask participants to say whether this is to judge whether this is mostly true or mostly false. That is exactly what we were trying to to get at the, the 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 mechanisms of what makes people judge a particular information as mostly true, uh, true or false yeah, but this kind of then means that you that you have some kind of confounding variable of users exposure to, to news or social circles that you have no idea about right so this is some kind of um, part that you Cannot really accomplish. Yes, yes, of course. And that is uh, one of the limitations of the of the mm. design. But yeah, um, we, we, we can only do so much with a particular um, um, experimental design. Um, but this is this is why we want to have this conversation because um, when we do do re reapply this um, uh, experiment, we want to really make sure that we get all these specific details right. So you're you're right. Okay, just a very last quick question, because uh, at the very end, you had some um, um, quotes from the participants, and a couple of mentioned um, uh, sharing, but this was not explicitly a concept in your study, right, the notion of sharing? No, yeah. Okay, so, okay so it just, just popped up in the interview. Yeah, it just came up in the Okay, interview. okay, thanks. Yes. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Christian. Uh, Carol. Hi, good morning, Catherine. Good morning. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and thanks for the study. I think for a pilot study, it really does have a lot of potential for upscaling. Um, the, a fair bit of work has been done elsewhere on you know, using games um, as an intervention 
tool to help build social resilience and or particularly informational resilience against fake news. So um, I think certainly there's um, a lot more that can be done in the local context to understand the efficacy of such measures uh, for the local population. I also appreciated the fact that um, in your game design, how you try to mimic you know, the conditions of a real misinformation or disinformation environment where people do not just get exposed to false information, but to real information as well, which makes it all the more difficult and tricky, right? So I just have um, two quick questions for you. Um, number one, I noticed that in your methodology, you mentioned the point when people play game, the game, they could either they either did so individually or in groups of two to four. I know you mentioned that the current sample size for the pilot study is small. I am just wondering if you observed any effects in terms of the people who played the game individually and for the people who played the game in groups, right? And if you did not observe um, any significant effect, what does the literature tell us? And the point of this question is, um, again, I draw parallel to people's exposure in the real world, where sometimes um, they are exposed to, say, false information on their own when they're consuming information and news. But oftentimes, they're also in a group environment where people share false information. So, um, so that's one question. And my second question has got to do with um, the recruitment, right? So how was the recruitment for your participants done? And what were they told that they have to do when they take part in your study? So um, I think it clearly, you probably know where I'm going with this. So I'm just wondering if there were any priming effects uh, or effects of self-selection bias, especially when, like you said, most of your 122 participants um, were young and well-educated. Thank you so much. Thanks, Carol. Um, yeah, great questions. Um, so we we didn't um, run a statistical analysis of the com to compare the um, the results uh, of uh, participants who play individually as opposed to groups because um, the data was just too messy. So we had, I think, only a handful of participants who played individually, and then we had the rest that played in groups. But then even those who played in groups, some played in, two, in pairs, some played three, four. And, you know, I think the number of people in the group already changes the dynamics of the game. So uh, we, we, we decided not to, to then run the analysis because, I mean, it's, uh, it's, the data is too messy. Um, and the reason for why this... This was uh, this this was the case is because you know it was actually really difficult to recruit participants and we could at the end of the day we could just only um, we set a certain number of gaming days and then we just let people sign up and then depending on how many people signed up for that day we just did we worked with what we had and then we divided people into groups based on the number of signups um, so so yeah we we didn't um, and. I think you're absolutely right. And we would love to have in a larger study to be able to really do this comparison of indiv uh, individual playing versus group playing. Um, yeah, so that's to answer your first question. The second question about recruitment, uh, you're absolutely right. There's clear selection bias. Um, so we recruited participants through, we started out first through um, convenience sampling. So uh, just, you know, we recruited people who were in my social network and my RA social network. And then later on, we moved, uh, we, we, we use uh, snowballing. So asking uh, our networks to then recommend other people in their own networks. And then the third phase of recruitment, we use, uh, this uh, social media um, a group chat on Telegram called S SG Research Lobang um, to recruit participants. Um, so you, there, there was definitely a selection bias in, in that. And also for the treatment group, uh, especially, uh, you know, we, 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 we told participants that your involvement would be at least three hours and like, you know, in the after, after uh, office 
um, hours of the day. So it was quite a lot of uh, time commitment. Um, so the people who participated in our study, you know, ha had to be like really motivated and interested in this topic about fake news and, and interested in playing a game about fake news uh, in order to commit uh, three hours of, of their time uh, in exchange for like a $5 grab voucher, you know, so, um, so yeah, you're right. Our participants were already quite motivated. So I think that could also partly explain why the, the test scores were quite high because they were already people who were quite aware about um, uh, fake news and quite conscious about, uh, you know, the, the, the um, potential for being exposed to disinformation, yeah. Are there any other um, clarification questions? Catherine, could yes. I just put, do a quick one? And actually this is, it's a link between um, something, a study that Carol did um, earlier. And I was wondering if we could draw some of those connections because I was very struck by the point about overconfidence that you, that you and your team found, right? kind of the feelings of invulnerability and complacency that, that might exist. It, it worries me quite a bit. On the uh, on the policy front, because you know that that suggests that you're not what you're getting is not inoculation, but kind of the opposite of, of inoculation. Um, and I was just wondering um, if you could say more a bit about that, um, Catherine, and and quite how you know significant you found some of those those, those findings. Um, and then on Carol's end, I mean, Carol, your study earlier on talked about you know even the informationally savvy. Uh, category of, of Singaporeans being um, both susceptible to fake news and sometimes sharing it as well, right? Um, do you see this as part of the same sort of phenomenon or is was, do you think there's actually some differences between uh, how we should interpret the existence of these groups? Thanks. Uh, yeah, okay. So are we, the question, are we getting, um, is the effects that we're seeing more overconfidence rather than inoculation? Um, it's hard to say. I think um, in, in, in this sense, our qualitative data and our quantitative data uh, seem to suggest different things. So our qualitative data was collected right after playing the game. Um, and uh, yes, in that in that area, we did see that millennials seem to you know think that oh yeah you know they're not exposed. It is a problem, but it's not 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 my problem, right? Or not a problem for me. Uh, but in the quantitative data, we saw that um, that the treatment group actually did worse on the true questions. Right, so fewer of them in the treatment group answered the two questions correctly in the post game after playing the game. And that indicates to us that maybe that actually, that could also reflect less confidence and higher levels of suspicion, right? So um, I think there's, there's a, a few different contradicting um, uh, indicators going on here. And this is something that, uh, yeah, I think we, we really should look a little bit uh, in, uh, in more detail and design our experiment in a more precise way um, if we, in, in, in future iterations. Um, to the question about, I'm sorry, your second question was about The second question was more for Carol, actually, because in a study that she and Sean Go did some time ago, um, they, they did find a, a one category. They, they, you had four categories, right, if I remember right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Information consumers. And they, their informationally savvy group was also actually um, quite highly susceptible to fake news itself and sharing it. Um, and I'm just wondering if you see that as part of the same broad phenomenon as the, the overconfident group here, even with the caveats that Catherine just uh, mentioned. Hi, thanks, Aaron. I, I had a feeling that you were going to ask a question. Uh, so the study that um, Aaron is referring to was um, something that we completed as uh, phase one of a three-phase study, and that study was released um, end of last year. So um, recently, we have just uh, presented um, 
to uh, Aaron and team, phase two and phase three, which deals a little bit more with intervention. So happy to have that separate discussion with you, Catherine. The intervention uh, that we studied was quite different. So um, for phase one of the study, we did a, uh, a survey with 2011 Singaporeans, right? Singapore residents. Uh, and um, um, so the, the, the findings, uh, we could generalize the findings to that of the larger population. So for that uh, part of the study, we wanted to look at um, the different factors that influence Singaporeans' susceptibility to false information. And we drew from the work that has been done that studied the effects of uh, political traits, media consumption, um, Psycho and psychological traits as well, right? So, um, and we found, uh, and we did regression and we did a, a K-means cluster analysis where we found that a few traits uh, really mattered and we came up with a typology of four types of information consumers, what we call the informationally diffident, the informationally um, disengaged, the informationally overconfident and the informationally savvy. Uh, so people, in the informationally savvy were less susceptible compared to the other three groups, right? Uh, and one of the um, variables that stood out for this group was um, the efficacy. So people who were mo more susceptible to false information, and in that survey, we, we embedded a stimulus as well to test people's susceptibility. Um, they tend to have lower self-confidence. So even though there was, uh, there were still people in the informationally savvy group who believed in the false information that was presented to them. The fact that set, the fact was um, self confidence set this part this group apart from the others, right? And so, from that findings, we were able to um, deduce that a person's level of efficacy and confidence play an important part in influencing their ability to tell fake news from real information. And I think this finding is also corroborated in a, quite a number of studies that has been done elsewhere, right? which drew the link between um, confidence and efficacy and people's immunity or resilience to false information. And hence, you know, the argument right, for uh, expanding and upscaling digital literacy efforts. That's really interesting, Carol. Um, and and I, I would love to have a, a further discussion with you uh, about this study. And I think, um, you know, I think a lot of the data that we we generate and the analysis um, that we we make from that data is 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 really a function of the tools that we that we use. And um, so I think the 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 fake news tests and all that um, is is not is not a it's not a particularly um, precise instrument. And so that could, it could be telling us a lot of different things. Um, and uh, uh, which is why this discussion is really important because uh, it, helps, it helps us to think about how, how can we design, um, you know, maybe the next set of fake news questions to be in, in a more um, uh, precise manner to test whether uh, uh, for, um, uh, you know, information savviness, for example, um, um, uh, and also levels of confidence um, in, in the way people respond to the stimuli. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think we are a little bit over the, 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 the short break that we're supposed to have. Um, so we'll, we'll have a break now and then we'll come back at 10.30 uh, for the expert panel discussion where we have Aaron and Chi Kong and Anne who will join us. Um, okay, so see you later. <laughs>